This morning's gospel lesson picks up where we left off last week. We are in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, which puts us at the night before Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion. This is the time when he is gathered with his disciples. He's washed their feet. He shared a final meal with them in John's gospel. He's given them a new commandment that they love one another. He's told them not to let their hearts be troubled or afraid because in his father's house there are many rooms. We pick up in chapter 14 now with, at verse 15. These are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day will you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a very powerful word in the scripture that we just read, orphan. I remember years ago doing a funeral for a woman in her 90s. She had daughters who were in their 70s. And together, as they got the news that their mother's time of death had arrived, they grabbed each other and held on and cried, and they said, we are orphans now, because their father had died so long before. It didn't matter that their mother was at the age where she should go, and you expect your parents in their 90s not to have a lot of time left. But the feeling was the same, whether they had been six or 60 or 70, that they were orphaned. It's a powerful image in literature. Dickens wrote about Oliver Twist and David Copperfield. If you were alive or if you've seen any of the posters for war orphans and the efforts to have them adopted and brought to this country after World War II, you'll remember what a powerful image those pictures are of children left vulnerable and alone. The disciples did not quite understand yet that Jesus was about to go forth and die, that he was going to be arrested. They'd had this wonderful meal together. He'd washed their feet. They had had a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and yet here they are feeling on top of the world, not knowing that he would soon go to the garden where he would be arrested and that they would flee into the night. So he takes this time to say to them, I will not leave you orphaned. I will come to you again. They couldn't quite grasp it then, but I'm sure that when he was taken from their midst and when they fled into the night, they felt that they had been abandoned and that they were alone. It would be a while for them before the Holy Spirit would come to them. First in John's Gospel on the evening of Easter when they were behind the locked doors and he came and he breathed into them and he said, peace be with you, and he breathed his spirit into them. And this comes just two weeks before the celebration of Pentecost when that same spirit is poured out on all flesh, sons and daughters, old and young, so that together we might know how to proclaim Christ. But we're not quite there yet. I'm sure that they grieved when he died and they put him in the tomb. They didn't even believe the message of the women on Easter Sunday morning who said the tomb is empty and angels appeared to us and said he is risen. Even when they went and looked for themselves, Peter and John, they could not quite grasp what had happened and they hid themselves away again wonder how long it would be before the words came back to him, to them, that he had said to them on this evening, I will not leave you orphaned. I hope you don't have the experience of being orphaned, although according to UNICEF, 17.8 million children on the planet Earth at this time have no parent alive. We see stories often in countries throughout Africa, countries where the Ebola virus had ravaged so many families as well as HIV and AIDS, where little children are taking care of their younger siblings, often going without food in order to feed them. We even use the word orphaned or adoption when it comes to pets. And you know how heartbreaking the commercials are, where they show you animals that are not loved. That is a feeling that strikes fear into our hearts. And it doesn't even happen just at the loss of parents. I think back to the first time I drove alone after getting my driver's license, and I actually passed this building then, 
and my only left turn was onto Ridgeland Road to go to Cranbrook because I could get anywhere in Baltimore County, city, or the surrounding states without making a left turn, unless there was a left turn signal. What about the first time you're left alone when you're a child and your parents think you're old enough because you've been brave and you've said, oh, mom, I can stay by myself, and as soon as your parents drive off, you start hearing things. You lock the windows, you check the doors, you make sure no one can get into the house. We understand what it is to be alone. But we also understand in our context what it is to have the Holy Spirit with us, in us, moving through us, because of the promise that Jesus made, because of Pentecost, which for us is something that happened so far in the past, but continues to happen for us every time we allow Christ to work in and through us. The word advocate here was not a great translation because there's not really one word that sums up what the Holy Spirit is in this explanation that Jesus is giving the disciples. What it really means is one who comes alongside. Think of the times when you learned how to drive, when your parent was sitting next to you, maybe fussing at you a little bit if it was like my house, or when you were learning to ride a bicycle and your mom or dad ran beside you and held on until you were able to go on your own. And then they let you go. And the feeling of terror gave way to a feeling of joy and freedom for, I hope, most of you. They must have been grieving when they thought he had died because they didn't remember his promise never to leave them orphaned or alone. Now, some of you have heard of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was one of the pioneers in looking at grief and dying. And she came up with the stages of grief that many of us are familiar with. First denial, saying this cannot be true. Then anger over the person leaving us, or sometimes at the person who's left us. Bargaining, saying to God, if you only bring him back, I will do whatever you want. Or I would trade my life gladly for my child, something I've heard so many times with parents sitting in a hospital next to the bed of a sick child. Then there's depression, the feeling that nothing will ever change, the sorrow that is overwhelming that builds and deepens as time goes on for some. And finally, acceptance, where you understand the person is not coming back and you accept that your relationship is very changed now. David Kessler worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross at the end of her life and gives his gratitude for her family allowing him to add the sixth stage of grief, which he calls meaning, finding meaning in the death. To find meaning in a death is not to dwell on the death itself. It's to dwell on the life of the person. It's not in the case of Jesus to say, well, God wanted him to suffer and die because God was not asking him to suffer for suffering's sake. But because of the choices that humankind had made, Jesus took upon himself our sin, our shame, our grief, our guilt, and rose to new life so that we might enter life with him in the fullness of God's kingdom. And that's why he sent us the Spirit to be with us, to fill us and use us. David Kessler says, when someone dies, ask yourself, what memories of their life do you want to keep alive? What quality of them now lives in you? What memories can we pass on to others? What lives within us now is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that is the fullness of God that was poured out on some for specific purposes throughout the Old Testament, that Jesus breathed into his disciples on the night of his resurrection, that the Holy Spirit would come on Pentecost and pour into the hearts of all of us. It's not just the spirit of the fullness of God, it is the spirit and the presence of Jesus Christ with us. And he said, if we believe in him, if we abide in him, if we stay connected to him, that he will work in us and through us. I believe this with all my heart. And I believe this is why the writer of 1 Peter talks about always being ready to explain to someone else the hope that is within us in Jesus Christ. Again, another passage that talks about suffering, that we should count it as gain when we suffer. Again, not suffering for suffering's sake and not the suffering of someone who is ill, not the suffering of someone with cancer, not the suffering of someone in pain, not the suffering of someone who has been injured in a physical sense, but the suffering that happens when we stand for Christ against all others. As I've said the last few weeks, as we've read from the epistle of Peter, this was written to an audience of diverse people gathered and joined, not in person. They were in different places, in different situations, in different occupations, in different circumstances. But what joined them was the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, which gave meaning to 
them and their life that was to come. It was transformative to them in the present and promising to them a future that would have no end. And this is why we must rejoice and this is why we must have hope. There's a lot of discussion about churches being closed during this pandemic. There are people who are very angry and feel that their rights have been violated. The Facebook page of the clergy of the Baltimore-Washington Conference was just lit up the other day when the governor made his proclamation before the county executives had spoken to say whether those phases would take place now or later in the county in which they abide. But what we have now is people discussing this openly. And some pastors saying that they have folks in their church who said, I will not wear a mask if I come to church. You can't make me. It violates my rights. And another man who, I, who fussed at his pastor until I fussed back a little bit at him on her page saying that we were all cowards, that God called us not to have a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and courage, that we are called to go into the world. But let me tell you, Epworth has been in the world even in isolation. I called Kathy Price, she had a birthday last week, and I'd say happy birthday to her now, but she does not have the internet. So she has not been able to worship with us, as many people have. So I called her to talk to her and wish her a happy birthday, and she shared with me what I knew without asking, that she was still knitting baby hats for GBMC, and I'm sure our other knitters are as well. We have Toby and Frida and Lisa, who have been sewing mask after mask after mask and distributing them to people who need them. We sent $1,300 to Pot Spring Elementary School to help feed children and their families who aren't able to eat because the schools are closed right now. We're feeding them over the weekend when they have no access to any other meals. We continue to reach out. We continue to share Christ. But we need to practice that with one another. What I want you to do in your home now is something that if you haven't done it for a while, you need to do. And if you haven't done it at all, you really need to get started. Always be ready to explain to someone the hope that is yours in Jesus Christ. The world is hurting right now. People are unemployed. People are worried about making their rent or their mortgage payment. People are worried about feeding their children. People are losing hope all around. You need to be able to tell them why Christ is your hope because the Holy Spirit is in you, working in you, and living through you. That is our hope. So sit down with your spouse and say, what is it that makes you continue to believe in the face of all that's going on right now? And share your own story. Share your own heart. Share it with your children. Share it with your grandchildren. Get on a Zoom meeting. Share it with anyone who is in need of the hope that is yours in Jesus Christ. We're about to sing a hymn that is one of my favorites by one of my all-time favorite hymn writers. His name was Charles Albert Tindley. He was the son of a slave and a free mother. He started his career. He was born in Maryland. I love that we can claim him. He was born in Berlin, Maryland. And he went to Pennsylvania and eventually in Philadelphia. He had no education and yet sought tutors to teach him how to read and write. He finally got to the point where he learned Hebrew from a local rabbi and Greek through a correspondence course with one of our schools of theology. Without the benefit of a theological education, he went on to qualify to be ordained as a deacon and then as an elder in the Methodist Episcopal Church. And there is still a church in Philadelphia that bears his name, Tindley Temple now it is called, United Methodist Church. He started there as the janitor without pay and became the pastor. When he became the pastor, the church had 130 members, and by the time of his death, over 10,000 members of all races became part of that congregation because he never lost hope. In spite of every obstacle in his way, he never lost hope. The hymn we're going to sing this morning, if you don't know it, just listen to the words or pray them as a prayer. Beams of heaven as I go through this wilderness below, guide my feet in peaceful ways, turn my midnights into days. When in the darkness I would grope, faith always sees a star of hope, and soon from all life's grief and danger, I shall be free someday. I do not know how long it will be nor what the future holds for me, but this I know, if Jesus leads me, I shall get home someday. That is someone who does not let Jesus' death be the end. He is formed by the resurrection of Christ from the dead that gives him hope. He is formed by the Holy Spirit acting in his life, and all he can do is sing his praise to God. 
So now I invite you in your home or wherever you are, don't be afraid to sing. That's part of how we proclaim the truth and the power of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. But let us join in singing this great hymn from this great man, Beams of Heaven as I Go.